folks, get out and vote. Leave here and vote. Leave here and vote. It is really, really important. It is really important to vote early. And apparently 6 million American voters have done just that, already cast their ballot. How that breaks down in Florida, we're still crunching the numbers. How it affects the race of the Sunshine State, we will soon know. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Donald Trump has just wrapped up a, a, a big event in St. Augustine, Florida. He's not done with Florida. The indications are he is going to keep returning to the Sunshine State, a state he feels he has a good shot at winning. In fact, he says he is winning it right now, despite polls that show something not quite that uh, being the case. A real clear politics average shows Hillary Clinton with about a four-point lead in that state. But Vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine, though, looks at Florida a, a bit differently. In fact, a lot differently. Take a look. Did I mention the punchline of my whole comment? If we win Florida, we're going to win. I mean, can I just tell you that? That is, that is the gospel truth. If we win Florida, we're going to win. All right, what uh, Senator Kane is saying, of course, is that uh, they feel confident, that is, the Clinton campaign, the Kane campaign, uh, that they are piling up so many leads in so many crucial battleground states that Florida would essentially be the icing on the cake. But have they gotten a little ahead of themselves? Shelby Holiday from the Wall Street Journal with us. What do you think, Shelby? Yeah, you know, Tim Kane used an interesting phrase the other night by saying, Florida is checkmate. If they win Florida, they essentially block Donald Trump's path to the White House. It's one of the key states in this election. But... There are other key states as well, and keep in mind, there are 12 and a half million registered voters in Florida. Only one million have cast their ballots so far. According to a recent CBS poll, about 20% of those Florida, uh, Florida voters say they could change their mind or they're undecided. And it's still a battleground. A lot of these polls show Clinton is up three or four points, but that's usually within the margin of error. So, you know, you never want to give voters the, the impression that you're confident or you're overly... Um, cocky about your results because the last thing you want to do is tell them you're winning two weeks before an election and they don't really feel like they need to go out stand in line and cast a ballot this is a race where every single vote will matter. yeah and i wonder who it discourages more now you could make an argument that would discourage trump voters if they look at these polls and say oh we might as well give up but you could just as easily argue that a lot of hillary clinton relatively lukewarm supporters would look at that and say all right she's got it in the bag how does it how does it break down? It cuts both ways. I kind yeah. of liken it to a sports game where if you're an underdog and you think you have a chance, then you're more motivated. People get more hyped up about it. If you're winning or if you're a little careless about playing tough because you think you're going to win, you know, maybe you don't go out as hard. So there is a lot of pressure on this state, but Donald Trump also sounds very confident. He just said at his rally, we're winning, we're winning. This is bigger than Brexit. Um, yeah, we should explain. A lot of people hear that, and you're, you're, you're great at this, but the Brexit thing caught a lot of people by surprise when Britain opted to break out of the European club there, and few polls heralded that or telegraphed that. But even allowing for what could be upwards of a five-point swing, as I think it was with Brexit, uh, that is still, or possibly, depending on the validity of these polls, uh, not enough for Donald Trump nationally, I'm talking about, right? Well, nationally, it looks like a huge uphill climb, but, you know, it, it will come down to these battlegrounds. You're states. right. And You're right, right now, Hillary Clinton's up, I think it's three and a half, four points in Florida. Um, so, of course, Trump wants to go out there and say, we can win this. You guys go out there. Everybody needs to vote. He keeps saying that at these rallies. Uh, he's hosting huge rallies across Florida this week. And uh, it does cut both ways. But generally, you want your voters to think that every single vote matters. So they go stand in line. They skip right. work, they skip school, and they vote. Yeah, so you're passionate about it. Bring out the passion there. Now, uh, one of the other things that has come up is this early voting. About 6 million Americans have already done that. They try to glean what that means by, all right, X number Democratic ballots have gone out, so they assume they're Democratic votes, which by and large might be the case, but it's not always the case. Is there any way to glean where that early voting is going? Certainly it's the Democratic ticket that seems to be pushing it more. What do you think? Yeah, the Democratic ticket has been pushing it, j just all kinds of voting in general. They have a huge ground game. The Clinton campaign has sent surrogates out for weeks telling people to vote early, vote absentee. So some of this data can tell us a little bit about the race. You know, Democrats tend, or Republicans tend to do better with this absentee voting that's been going on in Florida for about two weeks than the, than the Democrats do better with early in-person voting. Yeah. But some of these professors like Dan Smith in Florida say there could be a substitution effect where the people who are going to vote early in person have now switched to absentee. Uh, we could be seeing some tactics change. So it really is too 
it is too early to glean what's going on, but we know that women are turning out in high numbers and uh, Hispanics have registered more. So those are two trends that could be bad for Donald Trump. Again, it's just really early. It's, it's early. difficult to tell. All right, thank you. Uh, Shelby Holiday, The Wall Street Journal. All right, I want you to look at something if we have it to show here. Uh, this might not be such a slam dunk. Uh, AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner, for example, trading at about $20 less than the takeover price that AT&T is looking at. Uh, now, we would have questioned Randall Stevenson of AT&T, uh, Jeffrey Bucus of Time Warner. They did not decide to come on Fox. They went everywhere else. They went on a rival business network. They went on a rival news network. They went on Sprout. They went on Nickelodeon, the Speed Channel. Then they did AM Topeka. They did not do us because we would have probably raised these questions. Is the market doubting what you're doing, uh, doing right there? And not just on this deal. Now, all these deals and even the talk of more to come is propelling the Dow and the idea that, look, this is either an end of the campaign year sort of a phenomenon, uh, but something is going on. Rockwell Collins and BE Aerospace, a $6.4 billion deal, $4 billion deal in the uh, brokerage arena with Scott Trade and uh, TD Ameritrade. We're going to get to one of the principals behind that deal. But Jeff Locke has been looking at all of this and why all these deals, why now? Jeff. Uh, well, you know, it's rare, Neil, that we get an issue that can join both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump at the same time. But we can thank AT&T and Time Warner for that. Take a look at what Donald Trump had to say. Uh, he says he would block this deal if he became president. Take a look at the quote. He says it's too much concentration of power in the hands of too few. Hillary Clinton, via her spokesman, says she feels regulators should scrutinize this deal closely. Her running mate, Tim Kaine, says pro-competition and less concentration generally helpful, especially in the media. Republican Senator Mike Lee, the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee Chair, says there are significant antitrust issues with this deal. And Senator Bernie Sanders, who could not be more diametrically opposed to Mike Lee on most issues, says higher prices and fewer choices for the American people is what this deal would mean. You ask, Neil, why all these mergers now? Well. It's a very slow growth economy. There's not good ways to grow now, except by buying somebody else rather than the old fashioned way, which is growing your business, coming up with a good idea. Also, uh, it seems uh, that uh, 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 a lot of the research on this has been done in the past, finds that you can raise your prices when you consolidate. In addition, uh, if you want to say, keep the uh, rival business or keep a business out of the hands of your rivals, better way to do it than to take it over yourself. And that apparently is what AT&T is uh, gonna do. They tried, of course, uh, Time Warner, you know, tried it with AOL. I was in management back in the days at CNN when that happened, and my stock in Time Warner went from about 100 to about 10. Hence, I'm still working today. Well, yeah. we, I know you love what you're doing, and it shows in your on-air product, but thank you, my friend. Uh, Jeff Locke, by the way, uh, the White House is commenting uh, right now on, on this whole media transaction. The president saying that he hopes that regulators uh, would weigh this closely and that they would consider the impact of AT&T Time Warner deal on consumers if they decide to carry out a review. In other words, this is not such a slam dunk. It traded well south. That is Time Warner of the $107.50 a share bid. Uh, that could be the case that it's run up so far so fast that maybe the, the street is digesting this. But the fact of the matter is um, a point that I would have raised with the company's CEOs who opted not to come on Fox. They're not addressing this. They're confident the deal will go through. And they just said on AM Topeka, they think they will. I'll leave it to you to decide whether they did address that on AM Topeka. But they did tell Dora the Explorer to calm down. It will go through. <laughs> all right. In the meantime, have you noticed all this long list of mergers, the ones that just Jeff alluded to, and many, many more? Uh, and, and this is the time that it happens. But, but they don't always go through. And some big ones, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, and Staples, Home Depot, among others, ultimately never went through. Larry Glazer, Larry Levin, on, on this, Larry Levin, I should say. To you, Larry Levin, ending with you, beginning with you, get a sense that there's, there's something to the timing of this? Is it that they fear rates are going to go up, so they got to move fast? Or a new administration, Republican or Democrat, comes in, so they got to move fast? What? 
I think a little bit of you know, all of what you said, Neil, um, certainly the interest rates, I think, would be really the key, right? When interest rates rise, that makes these deals harder to do. It makes them more expensive. So obviously, we're seeing a lot of them now. We've seen a lot of them this year. Um, but the one thing I would say is that one thing that for your viewers, for people who stand behind me in these pits, it brings volatility. So it's, it's a good thing for these markets. Um, it brings opportunity. And that's really what the traders and a lot of your viewers out there want to see. That's for sure. Are you getting a sense then, Larry Glides, that we're going to see more of this as the, the weeks pass? by here certainly Neil it's, it's safe to say there wasn't a lot of love in Washington for this deal today and perhaps these corporate CEOs recognize the need to get in while the getting's good. And as we talk about, the financial markets have been very receptive to deals. Interest rates have been very low, and it's been a great time to do deals. Maybe it won't be such a great time after the election. The financial markets may change. The regulatory environment clearly will change. They become a lot less receptive to this deal. So they want to get this deal in before that hostility. You know, if this was universally hated deal across all party lines, and I think what's important to recognize is that the financial markets are also taking a skeptical view of this. There's a lot of debt outstanding for AT&T. Bondholders are really concerned about what this might mean for them. The bonds were put on ratings watch today. So they're concerned that this might be too much too soon, a bit of a haphazard deal pushing through before the regulatory environment just becomes too much. You know, Larry Levin, I got to wonder now, I know uh, uh, Time Warner stock has moved up appreciably. Much of that 25% run up has been post this rumored announcement. But others have kicked this company's tires, and I'm wondering yeah. the fact that it is nowhere near what uh, AT&T has announced it's willing to pay. Do you expect others to come forward, and will that be the name of the game, and even these other transactions, others come forward? I mean, you make a good point, right, Neil? The, the, the stock is twenty dollars off right. of the uh, of the buyout price. So yes, will others come forward? It's possible, and obviously, I, I, I think that some out there want them to come forward to help push the price up. But there's a lot of time between now and when this deal can really be agreed upon and be, can be okayed by the FCC. There's issues there, federal yeah. government, those kind of things. So there's a little bit of arbitrage and a little bit of worry, right? If the market does, if it does go up to that price, but maybe it goes down ten dollars first. So there's a little bit of issue, and I, I think a lot of people are scared that if it doesn't go through, it's going to go the other way. All right, guys, thank you both very, very much. Busy, busy so much. news and merger day. Uh, all right, it is nothing unusual to see a governor trying to push and finance and help uh, those running for state senate or legislature. Uh, it gets to be unusual when the sums are very, very large, and it so happens that the husband of one candidate he's trying to help is also weighing in on the Clinton email controversy, the drama, and indeed the soap opera, and maybe something worse after this. The man that was investigating her from the FBI, his wife runs for office and they give her more than $675,000 to run. It's unbelievable how Hillary Clinton got away with the email lie, the email scam, the email corruption. But now at least we have a pretty good idea. All right, just to bring you up to speed, that concerned uh, a Democratic state uh, Senate candidate named Jill McCabe. Her husband is Andrew McCabe, of course, would play a crucial role of the FBI in overseeing the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. Now, she ended up losing anyway, but she did get a lot of money. And a lot of people are calling into question, what was the exchange that with the governor's office that brought this? Republicans are already doing a FOIA request to get to the bottom of it, find those emails, if any, and what Governor McAuliffe might have arranged or done on her behalf to make this happen. And let's talk to former Department of uh, Justice official uh, Tom Dupree on all of this. Uh, Tom, uh, the governor's office was explaining, I think, in general that uh, two others or three other individuals got even more money. But this stands out, obviously, for who she she is or was uh, um, at the time she ended up losing. But but uh, that her husband was in this very integral role in the in the Clinton email investigation. Do you think or is the fear that the governor knew that? Yeah, Neil, I mean, this just raises uh, lots of more questions. I mean, I don't think anyone really should be surprised by the fact that evidence of this nature is coming out at this point. But I guess from my perspective, what's troubling about it is that it certainly raises the at least the appearance of impropriety and that there was some sort of hidden exchange or hidden understanding or hidden quid pro quo. And it doesn't seem like too much to ask that our public officials would simply take a look at the whole situation as an average American would perceive it and just say, look, maybe we need 
need to wall someone off from the investigation, or maybe we don't make donations and this incredible amounts to this candidate. But just step back for a minute and think about how this looks to the average American who wants to have faith in the integrity of these government investigations. Or that uh, Jill McCabe's husband, Andrew, could have just recused himself from looking at the emails in, in general because of who he's married to. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there were a lot of ways that the government still could have carried out a fair, impartial, independent investigation in a way that walled off the critical actors. So you wouldn't have this money trail. You wouldn't have people raising these questions and at least wondering whether or not, you know, there's actually some fire where there certainly is some smoke. Now, I don't know what makes it more alarming, the sums involved, because if you're looking at all parties, not just those from state coffers and every, we're over half a million dollars for a state Senate race. Now, that might not be eye-popping. I understand two other individuals got more. But, uh, you know, even former Virginia Governor George Allen said it is not unusual to see governors in that role trying to push party candidates for, to get, in this case, the Senate uh, on their side. But... There aren't a lot of cases like this, so there are only a few standouts, and this is a biggie, right? It, it is a biggie. I mean, look, I, I think it's a lot of money, no matter how you cut it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, governors are certainly entitled to support political candidates of their choice, and FBI agents and officials yeah. are certainly entitled to participate in investigations, but this is something that they could and should have seen coming that you have people, a uh, governor who's very politically connected to the Clintons, making donations in very large amounts to someone and the questions of improper influence. And again, it's something that could easily have been avoided had they put firewalls in place to avoid these questions being raised. All right, well put, Tom. Thank you very, very much. Tom Dupree, Jr. And as you all know by now, the FBI did not pursue taking further action against Hillary Clinton. We'll have a lot more after this, including what was said behind closed doors that now has a number of Republicans fuming. The president saying of Daryl Issa, he's shameless. Daryl Issa responds. All right, what is said behind closed doors, uh, the president blasting California Congress Darrell Issa is shameless uh, because of a pamphlet he has out that uh, thanking the president for bipartisan support that provided victims of sexual assault legal protection. Uh, in that comment there, if we can just roll back to that, guys, you can read this as well as I can there. Uh, bottom line, Congressman Issa with us right now. He ends by calling you shameless, Congressman. What did you think of that? Well, you know, the president signed 23 pieces of legislation my committee sent to him during my chairmanship and a number of other uh, outside of the committee legislation. And I was grateful for each of them. I was grateful when Vice President Joe Biden called, not only called me his friend, but invited me to the White House when we passed the expansion of the Violence Against Women's Act. In this case, this was uh, Mimi Walters, another congressperson out of uh, Orange County. It was her ma uh, basic bill. I supported it, worked for it. And uh, we put something out when the president signed it. Uh, he's making a big deal over something uh, that I'm, I'm a little surprised that he's punching down, but he is. He also made a statement that I found uh, actually worthy of Saturday Night Live. He said there'd been no scandals during his administration. and. Uh, I suppose he could say it was the most transparent administration in history, too, but uh, that's just not the case. No administration is without scandals, and no administration should expect uh, that we won't agree and work together when we can and disagree and hold the administration accountable when they're not right. All right, so in this, you were praised for the kind of bipartisan support he supposedly, uh, you, of course, wanted, and, and he had wanted, but in this case, he called you shameless for bragging about it. I guess, in, 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 in this. Uh, how do you answer that? Well, actually, he used the word chutzpah uh, in his announcing. And uh, uh, I found it interesting because we've put out dozens and dozens of pieces of literature in this campaign, as you often would. Uh, and we've gone out of our way to, uh, to try to put the positive side of what I've been doing. Neil, you covered me for many years. Uh, I had 10 years on oversight. Uh, but the last two years, we've been working on a number of pieces of legislation, including uh, the Freedom of Information Act, something that dramatically expanded your ability to get information about the administration, and he signed it. And it's the same situation. I appreciate the president signing things when he, he does. Uh, you know, just before the break, we had a major vote in which I sided with the president 
on what was called JASTA, and I sided with the right. Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Now, I was on the losing side, and the majority of Republicans voted the other way. We should explain, uh, this is the measure I, that allows 9-11 victims' families to go ahead and, in this case, sue Saudi Arabia. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact is that I've been an independent voice in, in uh, Congress. I certainly held the Bush administration accountable many times for their failures. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, what I find interesting is simply that he came out to my district and wanted to make a, a campaign issue. Uh, look, I'm, I'm very willing to run happily on the 10 years that I uh, was involved in oversight and the last two years in which I've been working on immigration reform on a bipartisan basis and working on patent and uh, trademark and copyright reform. What's interesting, Congressman, is, and, and by the way, we did reach out to your opponent, Doug Applegate, we've not heard back, but what is interesting is the president has long bemoaned the fact that, or his charge, that Republicans are not very much into compromise or bipartisan anything. Here's an example where you do, and he, he still rips you for it. Well, it's campaign season. You know, uh, Vice President Biden wouldn't uh, tell people that Congressman Issa wasn't just his Republican friend, but his friend probably today, but when we were working together on expanding uh, the Violence Against Women's Protection, we did. Uh, there, Neil, even though it's a shorter season than it used to be, there is a time in which people on both sides of the aisle get together and we get good legislation passed, uh, and then there's a time for campaigning. Uh, as you probably have been seeing this morning, uh, we have 10,000 National Guardsmen that are having tens of thousands of dollars ripped back from them after they met their commitment to reenlist, to go to combat. Uh, and there's bipartisan support right after this election. We'll be back in Washington if the administration doesn't act, passing a law that prohibits taking that money from those men and women who kept their part of the bargain. Uh, there are lots of issues that aren't partisan. Uh, of course, oversight is partisan by definition. Right. The uh, one, one party always wants to say they don't see a problem. The other party says they do. Uh, but uh, the fact is, my predecessor in Congress uh, held the Bush administration accountable. I held the Bush administration accountable when we were in the majority. That's our job. And uh, I think the American people don't want a parliamentary system or a rubber stamp. Yeah. They want accountability. Well, you either like bipartisanship and, and reaching across the aisle or you don't. You certainly don't do it this way. Uh, Congressman, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. All right. We told you a little bit earlier about the at t Time Warner deal that's running into, shall we say, a little bit of turbulence. Uh, those CEOs involved, Skip Fox, they did everybody else. Like I said, Dora the Explorer just wrapped up an interview there. But that did not apply and usually doesn't apply to all CEOs. We usually get all of them, including next, the head of TD Ameritrade, an eye-popping deal of its own after this. Only in the environment of an $85 billion media deal can a $4 billion crucial transaction in the brokerage arena seem like chump change, but at $4 billion, as I said, TD Ameritrade trying to scoop up Scott Trade uh, doesn't get, uh, well, kind of the same billing. Maybe it should, because at least those in the retail brokerage community will be trading back and forth on all of this stuff. TD Ameritrade CEO and President Tim Hockey with us right now. Uh, Tim, very good to have you. Thanks for having me. Uh, any issues to clear here to make this possible? There certainly are significant numbers for that media one. Uh, well, clearly we're a bit smaller of a deal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, there are certainly regulatory hurdles that we have to get approval on. We expect that to happen sometime in, uh, in 2017. We've modeled closing at the end of our fiscal year, which is about 11 months from now. All right, you will be a retail uh, brokerage juggernaut, the two of you together, offices all over the place, and now you're going to have some overlap. Uh, will that mean also some layoffs? Uh, unfortunately, yes. The, these types of deals obviously rest a lot on synergies, and one of the attractive uh, pieces of this deal is the amount of uh, opportunity there are for expense synergies. So uh, there will be, unfortunately, some layoffs, but we, we commit to be very thoughtful and fair and obviously uh, generous for those people who uh, get laid off. You know, there are so many deals to not only yours with Scott Trade, but British American Tobacco scooping up the rest of Reynolds American. It can get its hands on, obviously, the big media one I told you about, a host of others. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you add them all up, $200 billion worth on the table or rumored to be on the table. What the heck is going on? Well, I can't speak for every other industry, but I do believe that if you look back at some of the forces that are happening in the world today, whether it be low interest rate environments or relatively low growth rates, 
clearly what you see is an opportunity to drive for scale, uh, and that is certainly applicable in the industry that I'm in. All right. Now, is it also a sign of maybe an individual retail top that maybe the business wasn't and isn't there and that a lot of players are going to have to consolidate because it, it's shrinking up a little bit. The, the individual zeal, never what it was back before the meltdown, has never really returned to the degree many thought it would. Well, we certainly believe there's a lot of life in the uh, retail and trader and investing space. Uh, that's clearly the space that we're in. Uh, but Roger Reine, the founder of uh, Scott Trade, who did an amazing job over the last 30 plus years building a fantastic franchise, thought about it long and hard, uh, and he decided this was the right time to sell. Uh, speaking about that scale point, by the way, he, he recognized that in order to invest in his business, you needed to be larger. And so one of the great opportunities with this acquisition is, in fact, that combined, we'll be able to offer some great cutting edge technology platforms and capabilities to the Scott Trade clients that Roger just didn't have the scale to invest in. Well, you'll certainly have the scale now, but it does raise a question I kind of touched on the outset, that what has happened to that? Those days of the, you know, you're the taxicab guy buying internet stocks and day trading up on so many fields. Yeah. Will we ever get back to that, or was that unhealthy to begin with, uh, a sign of just overzealousness? How, how do you describe it? Well, um, I think there is uh, there's certainly ebbs and flows, as you know, in the marketplace, and people get more active over time and sometimes less. I don't think this is a structural shift. I think this is just cyclical. I mean, clearly, when you see uh, that markets are at this sort of high, what we've seen in the last quarter is just the sheer levels of volatilities have dropped right. down, both intraday and uh, uh, and that's had an impact on the trading levels. It's one of the reasons why we and and now combined with Scott Trade want to branch out beyond just trading to obviously be able to supply more services along the, the long-term investing continuum. Yeah, so to stick with customers for the long haul, help them plan retirement, exactly etc. Right. Do, do you um, think, given the timing of a lot of these transactions, your own including, uh, that, that uh, maybe you strike while the iron's hot, interest rates can only go up maybe sooner than we thought, maybe as soon as December, yeah. and that will continue a trend. And then you have a change of administrations, whether it's a Republican one or a Democratic one, change is, is, is afoot. And then a lot of folks are saying, well, whatever we want to do, let's do it now. Now's the time to do it. What do you think? Well, I wish that uh, transactions came along and they were very thoughtfully timed, but frankly, you never really get to pick your timing. Uh, I'm all of three weeks into being CEO at TD Ameritrade, and so uh, I would say the timing isn't perfect from my point of view, but uh, clearly from Roger's point of view and the opportunity to participate in the consolidation of the industry was part of his decision to sell, and we're just happy that we were able to put the deal together to announce today. He's done a lot of commercials. He's the face of that firm. Are you going to be the face of the new firm? I don't think so. You don't like commercials? Uh, no, not so much. Yeah. Okay. We'll see how that goes. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. That's Tim Hockey, the TD Ameritrade President and CEO. We have a lot more coming up. WikiLeaks ex exposing a, a lot of stuff going on in the Clinton campaign, namely a lot of name calling. Enter Elizabeth Warren campaigning with Hillary Clinton today. You think she could be a thorn in the side of a president, Hillary Clinton? We explore after this. All right. So we're with her. All right. Uh, today, uh, Hillary Clinton was campaigning in uh, New Hampshire with no less uh, than uh, Liz Warren, the crusading uh, progressive senator. Uh, the idea was to, to get the word out that um, uh, progressives should rally around her. Now, th there's a little bit of friction in this relationship, and some WikiLeaks now make clear just how much pressure was in that relationship. Jennifer Griffin in Manchester, New Hampshire, with more on that. Jennifer. Hi, Neil. Well, it was a bit ironic to see Elizabeth Warren and Hillary Clinton campaigning here in New Hampshire together. On the one hand, you had the Wall Street reformer, and on the other hand, you had the Wall Street beneficiary. Um, the WikiLeaks, as you mentioned, had exposed what the Clinton camp really thinks of the progressive left. Naive, radical, dumb. Those were some of the things they wrote in those emails. They were worried also about a potential primary challenge from Warren in November of 2014. Today in New Hampshire, it was hard to tell the two apart. We're going to ask the wealthy to finally pay their fair share. We're going to, we're going to close the loopholes. We're going to end the fact that millionaires can pay a lower tax rate than a nurse or a teacher or a police officer. We're going to make big banks pay for the risks they pose to our economy. 
Here's the hypocrisy. Clinton's campaign was built on super PAC money. The Washington Post found that donations from 100 of the country's wealthiest individuals made up more than one fifth of the one billion dollars donated to help Clinton's campaign. Clinton was by far the largest beneficiary of billionaires cash, with 19 billionaires donating a total of 70 million dollars to her super PAC priorities USA action. Hillary Clinton again said today that one of the first things she will do if she is elected president is to overturn the Citizens United decision, the 2010 Supreme Court decision that op that opened the way and paved the way for these super PACs, which her campaign has benefited the most from. Neil? Jennifer, thank you very much. Well, WikiLeaks does reveal what a lot of uh, Clinton staffers have been thinking of, some of the more progressive supporters of Bernie Sanders and to extent Elizabeth Warren, uh, now to Bernie Sanders supporter Adrian Ashley. Adrian, I guess the more that leaks out, the more your worst suspicions, I guess, are confirmed that um, the Clinton campaign thought you guys, not all of you, but, 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 but a good many of you were, were kooks. How do you feel about that? Well, we're not kooks, as the WikiLeaks have proven. But, you know, the, the other piece of this is Elizabeth Warren is going around and uh, telling Donald it's not rigged, it's not rigged. But a year and a half ago, she told Jon Stewart that Washington was rigged on behalf of the big boys. So is it rigged or is it not rigged? She's changing her story. And, you know, I have to be honest, uh, Bernie Sanders people were very, very excited about Elizabeth Warren. They wanted Elizabeth Warren as a vice president. She was one of his strongest allies. And then... When it looked like Bernie was, was going to get shoved to the side, she switched camps, and that really rubbed people the wrong way. What are you going to do? Well, you've asked me that before. I am voting third party. I am done with the establishment. I, like many other Sanders supporters, we are done. The big banks, Citizens United, so who's the third billionaires party? controlling who's the, third the elections. Party? I only have one choice. If I look at I side with, I'm 89% Jill Stein, but we have no write-ins, and Jill's okay. not on the ballot. So... I, I have no choice. I the reason why I ask you, and I didn't know that answer, but I, I refresh our viewers <laughs> who might not have met you, but I did want yes. to get a sense what you make of some of your fellow Bernie Sanders supporters who are going to write his name in. They, well, in Nevada, they can't, but they I already see. started. And, and that was a big challenge this morning. It's actually blowing up on Facebook is a woman posted her write in for Bernie Sanders and thousands of people are commenting they're like you're throwing your vote away you should be voting for Jill you should be voting for you know for what we can do in the next cycle because this cycle is over Bernie's already said that he's gonna hand his votes over to Hillary so you just voted for Hillary I mean that's this huge uproar because we're not being given a voice or a vote all right so if it ends up that she still enjoys the support of enough folks and enough <laughs> Americans progressives included that is Hillary Clinton to win this election uh, Will you be rough on her? In other words, will you be sort of clocking her progressive, you know, footprints here? It, I get the impression that Liz Warren will, um, <laughs> yes, because she's already be calling President Obama the on the fire. Go ahead. Yeah, we will be holding her feet to the fire, making sure that she upholds the, the platform that we all agreed on. And, you know, our big race right now is we have to take back the Senate. If we can do that, then it won't matter who's president, whether it's a Trump presidency or a Clinton presidency. If we can take back the Senate, we're good. All right. Watch it closely. Adrian, always good seeing you. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Well, you've probably heard about this AT&T uh, deal right now with Time Warner. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't like it. In fact, he, he, wants, he wants it stopped now. His top economic advisor is next. All right, normally Republicans, by and large, are uh, okay with uh, big companies merging and becoming even bigger. Not so Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, who's not keen on uh, this combination with AT&T and Time Warner. His uh, top senior economic advisor, Peter Navarro, with us right now. Uh, Peter, always good to have you. I, I think one of the things he signaled was that it would be a concentration uh, of power in the media business, more notably with CNN. Um, but was it bigger than that? Oh, it's much, uh, much bigger than that. I mean, the, the theme here is drain a political corruption swamp in D.C., but we also need to drain the media swamp. And if you just start from first principles, I think everybody watching now would agree that you wouldn't want to have control of the media in one hand. 
right? Um, then it becomes just a question of how many hands you want it in to have the public protected from the kind of influence peddling we've been seeing in this election. And therein lies the tale. And if you look at the words of uh, the famous Michael Eisner talking about Disney, uh, one time when he, he was being attacked for consolidation in the media, he said, my only job is to make money. Now, if making money entails basically perverting the news in order to boost ratings, then America's in trouble. And I think that's pretty much where we are. And so I've got a really interesting thing here, Neil, that harkens back a century ago to Teddy Roosevelt when he broke up the trust, the oil monopoly, right. the tobacco monopoly, the railroad monopoly. And the standard economic uh, analysis of that is simply that with those kind of monopolies, you get a higher price, a lower quantity, and this thing they call a deadweight loss economic uh, efficiency. So that's that wasn't what Roosevelt no, said. No, I he understand just said, what you're saying, The argument it's, against that yeah. is that they're already controlled. All the major news entities are controlled by giant conglomerates as it is. Time Warner, in its case, uh, is a multifaceted conglomerate sure. of which CNN is just a part. Sure. Uh, ABC, of course, to Disney, and et, et cetera. So well, that, is that, that trend the, already in place? Or would a President Trump yeah. uh, aim to dismantle that? I would see a rollback. I, I think we've gotten to the point uh, where it's gone too far, and I think this election uh, represents. What does rollback a, mean, Peter? Another for existing news organizations, he if, might if go you, to Disney you, and say, "Drop uh, ABC." We would cross that. He would cross that bridge when he came to it. But what we know now is, unlike any other election in history, this particular election has been a signal failure of the American media, the American electronic media, the American print media, because. There's simply the news is not being covered in a way which is informing the public about the policy issues that matter to them when they go to the ballot box. And, and so the question is, what's wrong? And if you look like um, Sylvia Berlusconi, when, when he owned a media empire, and right. he gained control of in Italy as president. Yeah. He, he to and then he went in there and he totally manipulated how the news was done. We don't want to be Italy. We want to be America. And, and it, you, you just look at one thing after another, like today, for example. The big story out, which is a huge story about how the wife of the FBI guy investigating Hillary right. Clinton for corruption received a bunch of money from Terry McAuliffe, Clinton's top confidant, who also is part of the Clinton Foundation. I mean, you can't make that up. You're not going to see CNN and MSNBC cover that in depth or fairly. You're well, not going to see well, the I Washington guess what I'm Post asking, though, Peter, I, I wish you had more time, but, but if you get a sense that, that Donald Trump surprised me, wins this election outright, would he, as president, would you, as his advisor, be aiming to break up news organizations? <laughs> not this one, Neil. Uh, but I think but what others, we need is less content. We need less ABC, to be serious be about this. At NBC, to be, be absolutely looking. serious about this. We need less concentration in the media horizontally and vertically because what we have but is that now a president's are role? Whether you're on right or left, Peter, is that a president's role to dismantle? news organizations or their parents. This is a standard operating procedure with antitrust in the traditional way. In the new digital age, what this election is proving to us is that the American people are not getting the information they need to make prudent choices. But that could be a slippery choices. slope, right? Whatever yeah, you pins I, I, the no news, No question right? about it. This is a delicate matter, Neil, and you raise interesting points. But let's be talking about it. We went from 50 organizations that basically were in the news game several All decades right. ago if we win Florida, we're going to win. All right. What uh, Senator Kane is saying, of course, is that uh, they feel confident that it is the Clinton campaign, the Kane campaign, uh, that they are piling up so many leads in so many crucial battleground states that Florida would essentially be the icing on the cake. But have they gotten a little ahead of themselves? Shelby Holiday from The Wall Street Journal with us. What do you think, Shelby? Yeah, you know, Tim Kane used an interesting phrase the other night by saying, Florida is checkmate. If they win Florida, they essentially block Donald Trump's path to the White House. It's one of the key states in this election, but there are other key states as well. And keep in mind, there are 12 and a half million registered voters in Florida. Only one million have cast their ballots so far. According to a recent CBS poll, about 20 percent of those Florida, uh, Florida voters say they could change their mind or they're undecided. And it's still a battleground. A lot of these polls show Clinton is up three or four points, but that's usually within the margin of error. So, you know, you never want to give voters the, the impression that you're confident or you're overly um, cocky about your results, because the last thing you want to do 
is tell them you're winning two weeks before an election and they don't really feel like they need to go out, stand in line and cast a ballot. This is a race where every single vote will matter. Yeah, and I wonder who it discourages more. Now, you could make an argument that would discourage Trump voters if they look at these polls and say, oh, we might as well give up. But you could just as easily argue that a lot of Hillary Clinton relatively lukewarm supporters would look at that and say, all right, she's got it in the bag. How does it how does it break down? It cuts both ways. I kind yeah. of liken it to a sports game where if you're an underdog and you think you have a chance, then you're more motivated. People get more hyped up about it. If you're winning or if you're a little careless about playing tough because you think you're going to win, you know, maybe you don't go out as hard. So. There is a lot of pressure on the state, but Donald Trump also sounds very confident. He just said at his rally, we're winning, we're winning. This is bigger than Brexit. Um, yeah, we should explain. A lot of people hear that, and you're, you're, you're great at this. But the Brexit thing caught a lot of people by surprise when Britain opted to break out of the European club there. And few polls heralded that or telegraphed that. But even allowing for what could be upwards of a five-point swing, as I think it was with Brexit, uh, that is still, or possibly, depending on the validity of these polls. And folks, get out and vote. Leave here and vote. Leave here and vote. It is really, really important. It is really important to vote early. And apparently six million American voters have done just that, already cast their ballot. How that breaks down in Florida, we're still crunching the numbers. How it affects the race of the Sunshine State, we will soon know. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Donald Trump has just wrapped up a, a, a big event in St. Augustine, Florida. He's not done with Florida. The indications are he is going to keep returning to the Sunshine State, a state he feels he has a good shot at winning. In fact, he says he is winning it right now, despite polls that show something not quite that uh, being the case. A real clear politics average shows Hillary Clinton with about a four-point lead in that state. Vice presidential candidate Tim Kaine, though, looks at Florida a, a bit differently. In fact, a lot differently. Take a look. Did I mention the punchline of my whole comment? If we win Florida, we're going to win. I mean, can I just tell you that? That is that is the gospel truth. Not enough for Donald Trump. Nationally, I'm talking about, right? Well, nationally, it looks like a huge uphill climb, but, you know, it, it will come down to these battleground states. You're right. And You're right, right now, Hillary Clinton's up, I think it's three and a half, four points in Florida. Um, so, of course, Trump wants to go out there and say, we can win this. You guys, go out there. Everybody needs to vote. He keeps saying that at these rallies. Uh, he's hosting huge rallies across Florida this week. And uh, it does cut both ways, but generally you want your voters to think that every single vote matters. So they go stand in line. They skip right. work, they skip school, and they vote. Yeah, so you're passionate about or bring out the passion there. Now, uh, one of the other things that has come up is this early voting. About 6 million Americans have already done that. They try to glean what that means by, all right, X number of Democratic ballots have gone out, so they assume they're Democratic votes, which by and large might be the case, but it's not always the case. Is there any way to glean where that early voting is going? Certainly it's the Democratic ticket that seems to be pushing it more. What do you think? Yeah, the Democratic ticket has been pushing it, j just all kinds of voting in general. They have a huge ground game. The Clinton campaign has sent surrogates out for weeks telling people to vote early, vote absentee. So some of this data can tell us a little bit about the race. You know, Democrats tend, or Republicans tend to do better with this absentee voting that's been going on in Florida for about two weeks than the, than the Democrats do better with early in-person voting. Yeah. But some of these professors like Dan Smith in Florida say there could be a substitution effect where the people who are going to vote early in person have now switched to absentee. Uh, we could be seeing some tactics change. So it really is too, it is too early to glean what's going on. But we know that women are turning out in high numbers and uh, Hispanics have registered more. So those are two trends that could be bad for Donald Trump. Again, it's just really early. It's, it's early. difficult to tell. All right, thank you. Uh, Shelby Holiday, The Wall Street Journal. All right, I want you to look at something if we have it at the show here. Uh, this might not be such a slam dunk. Uh, AT&T and Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner, for example, trading about $20 less than the takeover price that AT&T is looking at. Uh, now, we would have questioned Randall Stevenson of AT&T, uh, Jeffrey Bucus of Time Warner. They did not decide to come on Fox. They went everywhere else. They went on a rival business network. They went on a rival news network. 